It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. I've been fortunate to serve on the community board of U.S. Bank here in Sacramento and have learned uh, a lot about this bank. They are a wonderful partner and growing uh, in, in uh, Sacramento and in California and the West Coast, and I think we'll hear more about that. Um, this is how I met Richard Davis. I heard him speak this fall. He was a, a charismatic speaker, and I knew we wanted to have him uh, uh, here, and he uh, very kindly agreed. Richard is a 30-year veteran of the banking industry. He was named CEO of U.S. Bank Corp. in uh, December, and he's been a, a senior executive since 1993. Uh, most recently, he served as president and chief operating officer. Based in Minneapolis, U.S. Bank Corp. is the parent of U.S. Bank. It uh, is the nation's sixth largest financial holding company. Its assets are $219 billion, more than, has more than 2,400 branches and nearly 5,000 ATMs in 24 states. Locally, U.S. Bank is the third largest bank ranked by deposits in the greater Sacramento area where it has more than 11 percent of the market. So Richard steers a very large ship uh, and it plays a significant role in not only local but in uh, national and world economies. And with Rich, Richard at the helm, U.S. Bank Corp. is doing very well indeed. The profits jumped 6% uh, last year to $4.75 billion, or revenue of more than $19 billion. Those are very fine numbers. And you've made, uh, you may have read a few weeks ago um, that that very wonderful uh, investor, Warren Buffett, invested more than three-quarters of a billion dollars in U.S. Bank Corp. stock last year. And I think this is a testament to the quality of the management team that Richard has uh, assembled. Tonight, um, he is going to describe the major challenges facing his industry, uh, including increasing competition, an ever-changing ever markets, technology advances, and the political and regulatory climates facing uh, the banking industry. Uh, he will answer your questions following his presentation. So please uh, join me in welcoming Richard Davis. Well, good evening, and thank you, first of all, Nicole, for those kind words. My mother would have believed them. And um, I am delighted to be in your presence, all of your presence, but especially yours. Congratulations on the 25th anniversary last year. You're a founding member of this great school, and having done my homework, I'm proud to share its name. Okay. So, now look. I got to tell you, I went to night school for eight years at Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Long Beach. That's where I got my degree. I was a teller for most of those years. And having gone to night school, I know how tedious teaching is at night. Worst case, listening at night. So let's keep this really fast. Let's keep it moving. And I want to surprise you and please you with not the old banker boredom that you might otherwise expect. If I see you falling away or the or Paul in the back with his laptop, if he actually goes to the solitaire game, I'm going to know that it's over. And I'll just walk right out of here in a heartbeat. <laughs> let's start here. Um, as, we did, uh, as you asked me to talk about the um, kind of impending changes in banking, this would be just a quick set of words that might best dimension what's going on in the minds of bankers. Um, we're typically not very much fun at parties because these are the things we talk about. But <laughs> you'll appreciate the words that most of them, many of which would not have been present even, say, 20, 25 years ago when I was a teller. And we'll talk a little bit about how it's become so complex in just a moment. Um, the banking industry, however, having said that, is very strong. And to the pleasure of many of us, back in the 1989-1990 time period when banks fell away based on a commercial real estate crisis. We have learned a lot of lessons since then. I think you'd be very pleased to know that your country is in good shape. On 9-11, many, many years ago, after the tragedy in New York City, you all know that our first and most important act as a, as a nation was to get back the defense and protection of our citizens. But do you know, without exaggeration, the very second most important thing was to get the banks open again? And so for those of you in the room that work in banking or have worked in banking, let it be said that what we do matters because we do make the, company, the country move forward by the companies that we keep. How many of you remember the TV show Bonanza? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you don't? Because we're going to slap you. Ryan, you're probably one. I'm going to slap you around. <laughs> if anybody here doesn't know it, then they're too young to be in this room. You can leave now. Um, now, do you remember what night it was on? Sunday. Do you remember what was on around it? Come on. FBI. 
in Living Color. Mission Impossible followed it. It was always the same three. Here's why I bring it up. Back in the old days of Bonanza, let's go back to that point in time where Haas and Little Joe and all the other people were doing their Bonanza thing. If you went into the main center of town, you would probably have found a consistent set of buildings. A jail, a saloon, a general store, and a bank. Let's agree, that's at least, in my story, there's a bank. <laughs> in those stories, in those days, at that point in time, and God knows, gold rush all over the place, first time I've told this story in a place that might have mattered, somebody walks in, let's give him a name, Jeb walks into the banker, he ties up his horse out by the post, walks in, slaps down a bag of gold. Says to the banker in my story, listen, I've got this gold. I don't feel I can protect it where I live. I want you to hold it. And I want you to hold it for six months because I'm going to need this gold later on. But right now, I don't need it. So will you hold it for me? The banker says, I'd be happy to. Exactly how long do you need me to hold it? And in my story, the guy says six months. The banker says, I'll tell you what. If you don't mind if I do other things with it while you're not using it, when you come back, I'll have an extra nugget of gold in that bag for you letting me use your gold. And Jeb says, you got it, and walks out the door. Fifteen minutes later, Jethro walks up, ties his mule to the post, walks into the banker, and says, bam, I've got this bag of seed. I've got this mule up here in front. Hold on. Got it. I've got this mule. <laughs> I've got this mule up here in front, and I want gold to go out and buy the land about 20 miles yonder so that I can sow the seed with this mule, make some money. And the banker says, hmm, I've got an idea. If I give you this gold, how long do you need it to sow the crop and bring it back? And in my story, he says, about five months, three weeks. Perfect. <laughs> then here's the bag of gold, but here's the deal. For me giving you the gold, I need to share in your profits. So when you come back, I need two extra pieces of gold in that bag. And so the story goes. And the banker makes a piece of gold. The guy who's deposited made a piece of gold. We have corn. We all eat. We live. Simple as it is, that's exactly what we do today. That's exactly what we do today. And I'm going to make it very complicated in the next few minutes, but don't lose that paradigm. What we do, we are in the business of management of risk and trust. We know who to trust, and we know the risk to take. And every once in a while, we make a mistake. That's called a loss. Most of the time, we don't. And in the, in, at the end of the day, the reason the banks moved the country forward is because this building we're in was built by it, the funds from a bank. The car you drove here in was financed by a bank. The house you're going to go home to was somehow in the line of lineage of investing. There was a bank. So join me kind of in the simplicity of it all because I'm about to really screw that up. Now, this is my favorite. This is your community. Now, you see, a few years ago, um, when we were still living here in uh, California. I brought my three young children. They were young at the time. We wanted to uh, visit friends and family in Sacramento, actually in Roseville, and we decided to come to the city of Davis to take pictures of everything with our name in it. <laughs> that sounds so funny, but we have Davis City Hall and Davis Trash Can and you know Davis Chamber of Commerce. We have your your, your great water tower. I mean, I couldn't have made this up, you guys. Come on. I mean, but you have to know my very very favorite thing in life is I have an avocation for In-N-Out Burgers. I mean, I, to say I, and I'm a fanatic would be an understatement, and I could go on and I won't. I'll spare you that. <laughs> but understand how cool we all thought it was that on, I think it might be I-80, there's the Richards Boulevard exit. I swear to God, I didn't make this up. Where under Richard is the word Davis and In-N-Out. <laughs> and it just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> so there it is in the center of the universe. Couldn't have been more pleased. When you asked me to speak, I thought, boy, do I have a slide for you. <laughs> All right. Now, I know this is the uh, business school, but maybe there might be a, a physicist in the room. But does anyone know what happens at 212 degrees? Water boils. There you go. And you know what happens at 211? It's just really hot water. <laughs> and I love this paradigm because if you're going to go through the energy of anything and work so hard to make something happen, Hot water at 211 is inert, so to speak. And at 212, it's making something happen. And I will encourage all of you, especially in whatever walk of life you have, that we've all got to work to the point that all of our good efforts and energies actually mean something, no matter what you do. And in banking, we don't celebrate the near misses. We celebrate making things happen. 
and we celebrate doing things to make your lives better, even if it's cashing a check or making a loan. So 212 degrees is kind of a symbolic uh, sense for me of how I think of our company and how we need to keep throwing good energy after good and keep that pot boiling. The company today, and I will spend a couple minutes on ours, we are among the strongest, healthiest, and most vibrant in our peer group. There are 8,300 or so bank chartered companies in the United States, and even more when you add thrifts and credit unions. So to be number six is certainly in the company of the large banks. But it's very important that we don't let large equal bad, or large equal anonymous, or large equal average. Because that happens a lot in companies. It happens a lot in institutions. And what we need to keep everything one person at a time, one transaction at a time, one opportunity. This is a view of our company in terms of the United States. And the dark blue shows you the 24 states you would find the US Bank moniker on the branches and corners on ATMs. And you would see our brand as you see it here in greater Sacramento um, area. The rest of the country, we do business too. We're a national bank. But it's very important you see the distinction. Now, we do everything you could possibly want to do in banking. And it's in the blah, 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 blah category. But I will show you that Western Europe now shows up on our map because we are a, an evolving company with a leadership position in payments, moving money around, if you will, in Western Europe. And I'll tell that story in just a moment, but this is one of our largest uh, growth trajectories. And one of the reasons Warren Buffett invested in us, and others do, is because of our diversification of earnings. Of the top 10 banks of those 8,300, this is a list, and you can see our sixth largest size. The market cap is the value of a company. It's the, the number of shares multiplied the value of a share. So we have about 1.8, 1.9 billion shares outstanding, trading at about $35 a share. That makes the company worth $63 billion. To put it in context, it's worth, say, twice the size of Disney. So banks are very, very valuable. Assets are the number of dollars we have working for us. And some of the larger banks, you can see, have investment banks and things that have different asset measures. But if you were to do the math real fast, we are by far disproportionately more valuable than we are big, which is a moniker for the quality of our company, which is one of the reasons I'm so proud of it. If you invested in our company 10 years ago, $100, it would be worth $487 today. The peer group, which is the other banks in our uh, competitive group, would be worth 276 And the general S&P non-bank financial index would be worth about 224 So fair to say that it's a good investment. And you'll notice it wasn't all at the beginning. It certainly has happened over the course of time. As a company, banks can be complex or they can be simple. But I'm going to keep it simple here and show you that we make money in one of four areas. We do consumer banking, which is what most of us would enjoy. We do wholesale banking, which is corporate, middle market kind of lending to companies who do business. Wealth management would be trust and, and private banking, investing in your future, being there to the very last day. And payments is an area that we're evolving that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. On the right side, I'm showing you that the fee income of a percentage of total revenue, and Nicole said our revenue is you know, pushing $20 billion. The more a, a bank can make their income from fees and deposits and loans, the better they are as an investment. Deposits and loans move with the interest rate scenario. I call it the Bernanke effect. If Bernanke had a bad night, it could ruin our day. If Bernanke's happy, life is good. But half of what we make comes from the yield curve or the difference between the loans and the deposits between Jeb and Jethro. But now half of our company, which is mar far higher than most of our peers, we derive our income from fees, which are, in one hand, more predictable. On the other hand, start at zero every morning. Greatest opportunity in banking is recognized by the consolidation in the last 25 years. Let me show you a picture here. For those of you who've been in banking for a while, those of you who've just been around banking for a while, let's back up and I'll show you. You can barely see it here on the left-hand side. A little over a decade ago are the names of the large banks in the country that are no longer around. I'll read a few of them to you. Nations Bank, Barnett, Boatman's, Chemical, Continental, First Interstate, Norwest, uh, First Union, Core States, First Chicago, Fleet, Bay Banks, Mercantile, Crestar. All gone. All became part of these guys who then, with a couple more recent big conversions, became those guys. And now your top 10 uh, composition shows up there on the right-hand side. And it hasn't changed much uh, in the last couple of years, which is kind of demonstrative of the fact that there's not a new uh, shortlist. But it will probably again as we go through this next cycle, which I'll speak to in just a moment. The industry has consolidated a lot. The blue bars show you the number of banks. The chartered banks have gone down by over half since 1985. 
through 2005, the number of branches has gone up. Go back to 1985, except for the children in the room. Remember where you were in 1985. Just think about it. In 1985 was the advent in our banking world of the 24-hour call centers and the real pickup of ATMs. And having been in a branch at the time, in West Covina, California, in fact, I remember reading pundit after pundit telling me, as a banker, the jig is up in 2000. Branches are so, you know, 1990s. You don't need branches. We can get money out of machines. We can call people for information. They're gone. And I say to those people, having been a banker in 1985, neener, neener, neener. <laughs> because there are still more branches than there were, maybe half the number of banks, but still plenty and plenty more for the rest of our lifetime based on the average age of the audience. The industry is consolidated, but at the same time, we've been very profitable. You see, the net income is the blue bars, and then the blue line is the return on equity, which is a real good measure of bank performance. You can see back here on the left side in the 87, 88, 89, that's when we had the credit crunch. That's when banks got brought to their knees because they didn't have enough capital to support the losses that came out of the, equity, the, uh, the real estate market. This is very germane because six weeks ago, I wonder what I'm about to say now, but we may be facing a newfound crisis in the category of subprime lending. And subprime is the banks and the financial companies who made loans to people who are probably less qualified than they should have been to weather a downturn in their economic situation or in the interest rate scenario to pay back their loan. Now, what's interesting is there will be a burn spot in probably 2007 for subprime companies. Someday they'll be talking about those. The risk is which banks made those loans. And if those banks are holding those loans on the balance sheet and they go bad, the bank will be harmed. If they sell them off to the secondary market and the secondary market rejects them and go bad, goes bad, the banks get the recourse anyway. So I'm happy to report we aren't in that business. We don't have those kinds of loans. But I would say that if we had, we probably made a lot of money the last couple of years. We have a risk of losing some of that and giving it back over time. We are in a very interesting time. You can read the papers every day and see that this might be the first real crisis the financial institution community has faced in 15 years. If you can see this slide, and I'll repeat it for those in the back, but basically it shows you that the top 10 banks in America continue to take more and more of the market share. Not to the oligopoly that's found in Canada or Italy or Australia, where four or five banks are the entire uh, nation. But in this case, you can see on the left side of each chart is 1989. On the right side of each of the three charts is 2005. The red is the percentage of market concentration in the top 10 banks. So in the first two charts, 6% of the branches in America were controlled by the top 10 banks, and 16 years later, uh, 30%. And in deposits, 17 going to over 40, and in assets, which is another way for loans, 19 going to 55%. We will never go to five banks because this is America, and there's a community bank everywhere. And it's wonderful. It keeps us all on our toes, and it meets people's different needs. But understand, the concentration has occurred. This is the aha slide. Well, I'm looking for your reaction. Aha. In 1974, going way back, when the average general American-based company, corporation, middle market, just business, needed to fund their growth, they went to a good old-fashioned American bank. 78% of the time. And last year, less than half of the time, they went to a good old-fashioned American bank. Two things. One is they went to good old-fashioned foreign banks. Number two, they went to private equity, private investors, secondary market options, where they said, wow, there's a lot of money out here. I can get it from them. Nothing wrong with that. But I will tell you, there's not a single person that I have met yet especially those that I think I respect a great deal, to know this answer, that understands right now this total money market we're in, and whether it's a house of cards or whether it's a firm foundation. Because it's not unlike in 19, late 90s, um, when you look back at the uh, dot-com situation, a lot of us would muse around at cocktail parties and say, isn't it amazing? Companies that don't even cash flow are worth billions of dollars. Wow, that's going to come to an end, I guess. And it did. And all I'm saying is the money markets in our country are right now probably at their lowest point where traditional old-fashioned banks will have their role. And I submit for whatever, whatever will happen, foreign investment will slow down, the value of the dollar will change, private equity will slow down, whatever it was, I submit that banking 
enjoys nothing but an upturn over the course of time, probably never back to 78%. But you ask me what keeps me up at night, the challenge that you asked me to focus on was what are the paradigms of the future, it's where does that go back? One of our best problems is our best customers have all of our loans, and they're so strong they don't need the loan. So the good news is I've got you as a customer. The bad news is please use your loan. Pay it back, but please use it. Changes in the industry include consolidation, growth, and trying to keep it local, expansion of what we do, products, technology, technology, and oh my God, or as my daughter would say, OMG, technology, global competition, and non-traditional. First of all, megabanks. Is there such a thing as too big to fail? In the old days, in the 80s, there was money center banks, which are international companies that would do things like Citi and J.P. Morgan and, and manufacturers handover. Today, the large banks, the really big ones, Citi, Bank of America, and J.P. Morgan Chase, are so huge. You ask yourself, are they too big to fail? This slide I just slipped in yesterday because Moody's, which you know is one of the most re renowned um, uh, rating agencies, um, evaluated banks around the world. And they came out with a review of what percentage of likelihood is there that the local government of the local nation would stand behind one of its largest banks if it were to begin to fail. In other words, their proxy for would there be government intervention to save the day. And there were only eight banks in America that were identified at some level as being protected. We were one of those eight. And what they said is 70% likelihood that U.S. Bank, given our size, and our depth in government behaviors and activities that the government would come in and save us. So did some of those other top 10 banks. I submit to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, yes, there is finally a belief that it is too big to fail. That's not a good thing for the company because they'll start to behave like they're too big to fail. It's good for the nation to know that the banks are under a particular level of strength now that unlike 15 years ago, we will not hit a crisis that they won't be able to see coming and are prepared to help us with if something were to happen. I just talked to you about how many banks have gone from now half the number. And in the asset category, this 55% is a big deal. Because what it says is, you have to be careful. I have to have enough integrity and enough leadership acumen to always do what's right. But the more that becomes an oligopoly, the more risky it is that somebody starts to do things that are not good for the people that bank there. And my parents have been, uh, unfortunately, dead for many, many decades. But when I was sitting here talking to my management team this morning in Minneapolis, where, yes, it was frigid, we were talking about credit card disclosures, which is the current issue on Capitol Hill this very day. And I said to the folks in my credit card group, I said, so help me to God. If I were sitting across being part of the testif testifying myself in front of the, um, the senatorial group this morning, and they showed me something, passed something across to me that said, did you know your company has this disclosure or this untoward product or something that I would not want my mom or dad to have, or that would cause me to look at it and turn around and look at the audience to my leaders and say, we have this. I said, don't ever, ever let that happen to us. I said, I'm not giving you any other definition. I don't ever want that to happen. And if somebody along the way has gotten greedy or done something wrong or gotten excited about an opportunity where no one's going to notice and we can go in and kind of shortcut it, as far as I stand before you tonight, we don't have any of that in our company. But I'm smart enough to know I don't know everything. So I'm making it clear to our company, if someone else does know it, amnesty, raise your hand, let's get rid of it, let's fix it, and let's be stand-up people. That's what Jeb and Jethro wanted, and that's what we're going to do. And that's what the risk of this size um, issue could become if we're not careful. Banking is riskier than it used to be. There's a lot of reasons for it, not, not the least of which I've mentioned. A couple of years ago, not even 10, the biggest risks we had in banking were credit risk, are you going to pay me back, and market risk that the interest rate's going to go one way or the other. My first home was in 1978 in Ontario, California. My wife and I were thrilled to get a 13 and 3 quarter percent interest rate. Woohoo! Let's not do that again, you guys. This is a short list of the numbers of legitimate, I didn't make this list big for you, of legitimately the number of risks now that banks fear or worry about in addition to the things. Data loss is one of my favorites because data loss is if anybody that we have data on, trust us with anything, it's that you won't let that data out. We won't give it away, we won't sell it, we won't lose it. I'm ahead of saying this, and this is not for public consumption, even though it's being taped, I'm, I flatter myself that I think anyone's gonna come after me on this, but 
The Poneman survey is a Poneman is a group that's been doing surveys for years. We are about to be announced for the fifth year in a row now as the number one most privacy related competent financial institution in America, which I couldn't be more proud of because of all things you worry about is that we are going to protect the trust you give us. I'll tell you what though, when TJ Maxx a couple of weeks ago, if you were paying attention, announced that they had a data breach, turns out that the data breach was three years of data loss. And there's another bank that was a merchant acquirer, which means they handle the transactions that get swiped through those cards. They were holding that data and that news, and they didn't tell anybody for months. And so for all I know, one of my customers went to TJ Maxx in September of 2005. Their card data was taken from by somebody. They'd been victims of identity theft. I've probably paid for it a thousand times. They've gotten a new card since, and nobody tied it to TJ Maxx. That's a bad company, and the bank that's responsible is a bad bank. Because we're sitting out there right now thinking at least the people who care about us would not let something happen to us if they knew it. And if something happened to this company, we'll be the first to tell you. Tylenol taught us a lot of years ago, it's not what happens to you, it's how you handle it. And in your business courses and ethics, that's got to be most important. And that comes to the last one, which is reputational. Boy, if there's nothing else you stand for as a bank, it darn well better be your stand-up people. Integrity is everything. Look, we're not McDonald's. We're not Nordstrom's. And the difference is this. If I worked at McDonald's, if I visit McDonald's, and I'm wondering, what's integrity look like there? What's ethics? What are the morals? And I think Ray Kroc had a lot of good key um, tangents to his thoughts. But if I walked into McDonald's, my biggest ethical worry is that if Billy or Joni flipping their burgers in the back accidentally flipped one on the floor, wouldn't put it back on the grill without no one looking. That's my biggest worry. And in Nordstrom's, with all due respect, if I wanted black shoes, and they bring out the ever infamous non-ending seven boxes of shoes when I ask for one, my biggest worries are going to bring out the wrong color of red, not whether or not it's life or death. But at a bank, if we mess it up, second to your physical well-being, your data records and your own you know, final privacy with your doctor, second to that is us. Don't mess with my stuff. That's what I should have said. The birth of risk management has created a compliance culture, which is very, very tedious. Now, here's my message to anybody who's in business, and I think this is an easier road to take. The compliance is outrageous. The, the regulation is suffocating. And, oh well, get over it. <laughs> because it's the way we operate today. And so when I hear anybody in our company grousing about the cost of compliance or the time and energy, I get right in their face and say, stop it. It's what makes us all sleep better at night. It might be a bit of a pendulum swing right now where government intervention is watching a little more closely than they used to, all of us. That's okay. But you know what? Banks have been governed for over 100 years. We've been well overseen for a long, long time. FDIC, Office of the Comptroller, the Fed Reserve, all of that. So let's just get along with it. Let's be great at it. Let's not challenge it. Let's not fight it. Let's do all the things that are well intended and help us prove to ourselves and to our customers that everything is safe. And in banking, that matters a lot more, I think, than burgers and shoes. The balance is the question, right? What's the challenges in the future? It's keeping the balance. So as I go to this, the, quickly the second part of my conversation, I thought I would do kind of the David Letterman's top 10 version of things. Way less exciting, by the way. And you know, John McCain's not here to announce his presidency either, so we're just going to have to get along with that. 10 things to make sense of are identified as regulatory, E, product or service. Let's look at each of them. First one is regulation. These are now the governing bodies or the regulations that we have to respond to. Oddly enough, we have regulation A through Z, truly. There was an R and it was repealed. We have A through Z and we actually have double A. We have Greech, uh, uh, you know, Grand Leach Bliley, that's GLB, you know all about that. AML, which is American Money Laundering. Do you realize that this is true and I haven't seen it happen yet. If in my company, where we have 10,000, 20,000 tellers, if somebody doesn't report a $10,000 cash transaction, wittingly and knowingly doesn't report it under the Terrorism Act, I could go to jail. In Loma Linda, California in 1995, I ran the Southern California region for what was the new B of A. I used to be at Security Pacific. A 31-year branch manager in Loma Linda, one of our big old branches, right out there by the Loma Linda Medical Center, right, local, you guys get that? He had that happen to him. And today, he's in jail. 
I'm telling you what, they mean it. I don't, I don't, by the way, I support it. We cannot support terrorism. But I'll tell you what, zero infractions for 20,000 tellers every day. That's a pretty hard uh, road to tow. So we have to be very, very careful. But you understand that if a teller were given a payola by a bad person to accept $10,000, $11,000, $20,000 cash transactions and not report them, there could be a seed, a thread there to catch the bad guy. And we would miss that opportunity. I just want you to know that banks are put in, for, in front of so many responsibilities. We are right there with the Department of Defense. And the category of cocktail conversation, when you really have nothing else to talk about, you can throw this one out. And they'll run like, the, like rats. <laughs> U.S. Bank and Bank of America are routinely called upon the most by the Department of Homeland Security. Because of all the things that still we don't understand, is why was American and United, the airlines, most targeted at 9-11? And do people think that they were the airlines of the country based on their name? And U.S. Bank and Bank of America, God, I love our name. But can I tell you how many times they call and say, we worry that because of your name, there could be some outsiders, some bad people who might think you're the Bank of the United States or Bank of America. And so more often than not, we get calls routinely asking us to keep an eye on certain things. So how exciting is that? <laughs> that also keeps me up at night. But bottom line, these are the regulations. Technology is changing quickly. My headline is, the swipe is so 2006. What's happening now is the automatic readers, uh, where you have now a card and you just kind of wand it next to something. You may have seen some of those. Uh, we are, we've been testing that. Uh, we're the bank of the Denver Broncos. And I went to the Broncos game last season and celebrated our big day there. And in the tent, we had all kinds of customers. And we were showcasing our new contactless card and how it works. And I stood there, and I met as many customers as I could. And what I walked away from is, everything has its time. Not yet. I had person after person saying, wait a minute, my card's in my pocket right now. If I get too close, is it going to debit my account just because I got near it? <laughs> or a woman with a pocketbook, she says, if I set it down here, will it read through the pocketbook, kind of like the RFID does on the toll booth? The answer is, maybe. <laughs> so, gee, maybe we should keep testing this a little bit more. Um, you know, so join me in knowing that the technology is moving fast, but God love people. We are only going to let it move as fast as we are damn well ready. <laughs> Key challenges, loss prevention. This is very important. Most of the time, your bank will stand in, stand up, and pay back losses you would, serve, you would, you would uh, take as a consumer. If you do something right now on the Internet and somebody steals your number and you lose money, we'll pay for all of it. If you go to an ATM machine and somebody stole your card, we'll pay for all of it. That's our job. But by the way, it's like Target or Walmart getting things stolen off the shelves in droves. It's called breakage. It's very expensive. And so our job is to help protect you with a self-serving goal of protecting us so that we can detect the fraud. The newest and best fraud uh, issue right now is phishing and farming. PH, phishing, PH, farming. P phishing and farming. It's all these things on the internet. February 4th of 2005 was a uh, weeknight, and I was actually got a call. I was in Phoenix on business, and I got a call, and someone said, our internet site is unaccessible. So I said, please repeat. <laughs> that doesn't compute. They said, no one can get to our online banking site. And I said, I don't understand. And they said, well, it would seem that there is a, what they called a, um, uh, 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 think of it like Scotty and Spock in the force field. And somebody, some bad people, were taking and sending so many messages into usbank.com that they created a denial of access. And there were like millions, like per second. And so you as a consumer is trying to get in, just do your banking, and you know you got the can't, no can do. For a little while, you'll think, oh, my computer's broken. I love it when you think that. But at the end of the day, it's, the bank's not working. We were there 28 hours we were out. It's the biggest single um, breakage in our history. Hopefully you don't know that. 28 hours we were out. Secret Service, FBI, it was like Dragnet. It was very exciting, quite frankly. True story. I can't make any of this up. It's just too weird. We traced it, we traced it, we traced it. It turns out that in Malaysia, this is just like in CSI or some cop movie, they traced the original sending computer that was collecting all of these other computers and then shooting back to our site. By the way, the goal was to grab data while we were trying to fix it. They didn't. It's like the force field fell down and they were shooting at us. And over that period of time, they, the, the cops in Malaysia apparently broke through the room and they walked in and there was a computer 
sitting on a floor by itself, just like in the movies. And it turns out that over years, these bad people have worked around the world through janitorial services and accessed codes from PCs all over the world in places at night to program them at the right time to make them do the work of the denial of service. Is this amazing? Okay, by the way, six of the top 10 banks were affected in the same time period. Nobody got into anything. What it was like, like a pinging, and what happens, we all got force fields and we spent a lot of money and nobody, we're impenetrable now. But that's the kind of stuff, you know, you're sitting along, I think, I, actually, honestly, I think I was in and out at like eight o'clock at night in Phoenix. And it's like, hello, what do you mean we can't get to our internet? That's the kind of stuff, fraud is no longer, bang, bang, I've got a note, give me your $2,400. Which, by the way, the average loss at a robbery is $780. The time served is seven years. It's not a very good business. Don't rob a bank. And we will catch you. <laughs> and just because you're interested, we average about 1.4 robberies every single weekday in our company, somewhere in the company. It's just that pervasive. Competition on every corner. I just add Walmart because, you know, they're trying to get a bank charter. They're not bad people. But the way I see it, and I'm asked this all the time, how do you feel about Walmart or someone else getting a bank charter? I say, you know, the day that they let me sell products in the branch, I guess we can talk. But right now, banks have no right, and by the way, no need, to sell other products. And last I looked, Walmart doesn't need to be a bank. So there. Key challenges, domestic and political. SEPA is the Single European Payments Association. It's a brand new kind of emerging deal. It follows the euro where they try to get one, one currency. Point is, we're a Western Europe company. We're doing payments. It is a nightmare of political understanding and webs of different changes. We've got to be on track. So tonight, as I join you in Sacramento, I'm already worried about as the sun rises in a few hours in, in Dublin, where our bank is headquartered in Ireland, what's happening in Europe. I used to just worry about Kansas tornadoes, but now I worry about that. And in our own great government, we have a lot of issues, not the least of which is the credit card concerns they're dealing with today. Key challenge is diversification of revenue. I mentioned to you earlier, the better you can diversify where you get your earnings, the better an investor likes it because you have a chance to not be kind of a one-trick pony. Key challenges are bank products commodities. Right now, quickly, piece of paper and pen. Write down the difference between checking accounts. Right, you're done. <laughs> a checking account is a checking account. It may have a rewards program. It may have a debit card attached to it. The deal is the only distinction are the people behind it, just like it was in Bonanza days. Globalization, trying to figure out what's going on in the world. And the more we understand the world, the more we realize it's flat. I'm telling you right now, one of the biggest issues is, a, two weeks ago, BBVA, one of the largest banks in Spain, bought Compass Bank shares in Birmingham, Alabama for $10 billion. You're not impressed enough. They bought it at a price that would have been, for me, 45% higher than I could have justified. Now, the reason that's important is because in Spain, they have a different regulator, they have a different cost of capital, they have a different hurdle rate, if you will. So all of a sudden, a bank I might have wanted to buy got bought right out from under me by somebody who has a wholly, wholly different set of rules. Are you with me? That is a big deal. And a few years ago, BBVA, who I still don't know what they stand for, would have not even been in my vocabulary. And tonight I'm talking about it, and that's just a couple of weeks ago. Key challenges, the payments are sh shifting. The newest question is, are people going to use their mobile device, their cell phone, as their payment device? And already someone's saying, are you kidding? A cell phone, it'll be the PDA. The cell phone is so 2007. And someone else saying, a PDA, are you kidding? It's going to be Ethernet. People are going to, I, I was in Beijing about a year ago. The technology is in place. You take what looks like a PDA. It's not much bigger than a PDA. You set it down on a hard surface. It pops out with a little pendulum like a frame, like a picture frame. And then a red laser shoots on the hard surface a complete keyboard. And you start touching. And you're done. It's all wireless. And you're outside in Nowheresville typing what you want on a red infrared rock. And they say that's going to be passed up next year. I don't know where we go next. But all I know is we're going to be fast followers, not bleeding edge. No one's smart enough. We're not, certainly. So we're going to follow others as they go. In this case, kind of like the contactless card. Not sure my cell phone's going to do that. Regarding payments, remember the graduate? This actually came out of there. I just one word to say plastics. 
plastics are really going to move on to become less and less important. And we were just talking about the beginning of master charge. And back in the 60s when that started up, it was master charge and Bank America card. That was Visa and MasterCard. And in the old days, they were simply unsecured lines of credit. Oh yeah, there's a plastic attached to it. Those are the old days when we used to write checks too. Well, checks are going away over time. Cards are going away over time. Things will become more ubiquitous. You will do more things on the internet. Whatever that ends up being, this will become yesterday's news. I only have one thing to highlight on this chart, and that is that in two, 1990 and five-year increments forward, the red shows you the number of checks that represented the payments that people used in 1990. 60% of what we did we wrote checks for. And I know the old line, how could I be out of money? I still have checks. But the fact is, is that 2010, in four, five, three years forward, checks will still be present, but at 18%. That's a lot of movement, you guys, in that short a time. In our lifetime, that's one of the faster moving paradigms we're going to experience. The yellow is credit cards. They are still youthful and growing strongly. The blue is debit cards. The best news of all in this story is in 1990, cash was less than 20%. And our projections are in 2010, it's still 15%. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to report that cash is still all that matters. And you and I, like all of us, still walk around with the green, cold, hard stuff. And as good earthquake prepared people, I used to have my earthquake kit in Southern California, loaded with five $100 bills with the food and the blanket in case at the end of the day, you know it's going to talk, don't you? Money, cold hard cash. Not going to work your way out of a problem with your internet code or your uh, plastic. 15% <laughs> of all checks now clear digitally. If you're not experiencing it yet, you're going to. One of the best stories I had was my mother-in-law, who is alive, called me the other day and she was very upset because she went into what was the Macy's equivalent and they were starting to, to, to capture the check at the point of transaction. And they took her check and they rotated it through and they handed it back. This is so great, I couldn't make this up. And she said, I told them I don't want the check. And, my, and I said, well mom, they already got what they want out the check, they scanned it. And she said, I want them to keep the check. If I don't give them the check, I haven't given them what they need to give me the stuff. And I said, well, what, what finally happened? She goes, I made her take the check. And she ripped it up in front of me. And I think that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the point is, for me, I write the check. I give it to you. You give me something in return. Don't mess with my paradigm. <laughs> and so this is going to start messing with our paradigm. We and merchants want to kill paper because it takes a lot of time and energy to handle. Consumers, I've talked earlier, will take a little bit more time. So we'll try to balance kind of as we move forward the, the movement of kind of this technology. I will, was going to close here and show you that of all of our bank peers, we are twice more invested in the payments category. By 19% of our earnings is in the payment space, which is this European business, this card stuff. When you swipe your card at the next time you go somewhere, one third of the cards transacted in America are US Bank through a company called Nova. So see, we make our money on more than just loans, and that's good business because the world's going to get bigger and people will use their cards. By the same token, we have to be ahead of you and figure out what you're going to want next by twice more than our peer group. A key category of goal is satisfaction and loyalty. Real quick, is a bank a utility? Quick, quick, are they? Are they a like utility? Not really. Quick, is a bank really more like a church? Are we a not-for-profit? I know you think we should be. We're not. Okay, well, here's the deal. We track in our company every single month three things. Service disruptions, where we did something wrong, we know what those are. Ask our employees to evaluate each other on the back offices, and then we ask our customers, 20,000 customers every month, with a recent transaction within 72 hours of that transaction, how they feel about our company. Here are the results. We've been doing this for a long time. On a scale of one to 10, nine or 10 being best, we ask a lot of questions, three of which we say, are you satisfied overall? Would you continue to do business with us and will you recommend us to a friend? Nine or 10. If you give us a nine or 10, we'll give ourselves credit in those three bubbles. If you give us a nine or 10 in all three questions, we consider you loyal. Now this blows my mind. I, as a layman, would put banking right next to root canal, trip to the post office, and dealing with my cable TV provider. Oddly enough, if I asked you right now to rate your cable TV provider, your dry cleaner, and your uh, cell phone uh, provider, what would it take to get a 9 or a 10? And I am delighted, by the way, that I would be wrong in guessing too low because a lot of customers really, really like us. 9 or 10 in all three questions, pretty darn good. 
remember Norma Ray when Sally Fields got up and said, you really, really like me? Do the same ones who didn't see Bonanza. But <laughs> in this case, I'm delighted about this number. But what I say to our employees is 61% are loyal to us. 39% aren't mad at us yet. And that's what we have to work on, problem resolution. If you're a statistician at all, and perhaps you who answered 212 degrees are, if you appreciate statisticians at all, in 2002 to 2006, we've gone from 48 to 61 percent of customers deeming us as loyal. That is statistically meaningful, and I couldn't be more proud. Someone said, well, when do we stop? I said, good knows. Who knows? I know we're not there yet. When we arrive, I'll be the first to tell you. But right now, we've got a long way to go. Let's just keep working on it. So looking ahead, it's kind of like looking back. A lot hasn't changed. It's still kind of the basic business of trust and risk. And all this other stuff is blah, 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 blah. But it's to be reckoned with because it's important. As Yogi Berra said, the future just ain't what it used to be. And in our company, we have to continue to grow our revenue because our shareholders expect it. You see, somebody bought a share of stock today for $35, and they expect it to be worth a lot more in a few years. Everybody in this room that works for U.S. Bank, we're obligated to them. Everyone here who banks with us, we're obligated to you to meet all of those needs. We want to be the best management team in the business, and we promise to be good leaders. Not managers, but leaders. So here's my close. It was now a year and a half ago. I'm a big NFL football fan. Sorry. I should have said basketball, but I can't. You guys are close, by the way. A couple wins, and you might get in there. Um, <laughs> you're 28 and 32. You can get to 500. Fourth and one. It was week seven of the NFL. Who likes the NFL? Who at least go along with me on this one? Week seven of NFL was last year's season. And uh, Kansas City was playing at home against Oakland. And it was three seconds on the clock, and it was 23 to 20. Now, you've got to understand, this is Sunday. I think I'd just been out all day. I came home, and for me, this was late in the afternoon because we get it you know, two hours later than you. And I was channel flipping, trying to catch the very end of the first set of games. So I was so delighted to find an over a near overtime game. And there it was, 23-20. Kansas City was behind at home to Oakland. Kansas City had the ball on the three-yard line. There was a few seconds left. Dick Vermeil, at the time, was the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, and as you may know, one of the Hall of Famers, one of the best coaches ever. Oakland had two timeouts left. So the ball gets ready to be snapped, and Oakland calls the timeout, just to unnerve, potentially, the Kansas City um, kicker. They do it twice. Now they're out of timeouts. Now we're going to go for it. The ball snapped. Kansas City goes for the touchdown. Gets the touchdown. 26-23, takes the extra point. 27-23, clock runs out, home game. People go crazy. You with me? Took the cut, and they said, they had the reporter go up to Dick Vermeule after the game. Dick's 69 years old. And the reporter is a young cub reporter, 25, 28. The reporter gets the microphone right in front of his face and says, Dick, what were you thinking during that three seconds? My God, what was going through your mind? And Dick, I mean, unabashed looked at him like, are you serious? He said, I was just waiting for the timeouts to come and go. I know, but I mean, during those timeouts, I mean, you must have been pondering field goal, you know, touchdown, field goal, touchdown. I mean, let's face it, Dick, you guys could have walked through. The field goal was a given. Three-yard line, my God, you had an 18-yard field goal. You were in, tie game, overtime. You had the momentum behind you, lived to fight another day. You probably could have won the game. So what made you think touchdown? And only Dick Vermeil, the way he is, says, I got to tell you, I, I never thought, ever thought anything but touchdown. It never crossed my mind. I said, well, well, why not? He said, because it's week seven. We're in the hunt. Do you know what my team would have thought if I had said go for the field goal? I believe in them. I have to go for the touchdown. I had to. I had no choice. And yeah, we won. Good for us. I won the minute I decided to go for the touchdown. And then I turned off the TV and I thought, wow, that's very cool. And that's what I would say to those of you either in the graduate school of business or in the real world that we're all in. We've got to believe in something. And most of us are in the business of people. And the best thing to do is believe in people. Arm them with everything they need. Give them all the guidance you can. Get the heck out of their way. Let them do what they do well. Very cool. And that's what I would say to those of you either in the graduate school of business or in the real world that we're all in, we've got to believe in something. And most of us are in the business of people. And the best thing to do is believe in people. Arm them with everything they need. Give them all the guidance you can. 
get the heck out of their way, let them do what they do well, and be there to support them. The U.S. Bank is one of the largest banks in the country. It's actually one of the largest banks in the world. I ask our employees, and I'm telling you in the room here tonight, don't ever, ever let us get in front of you. We'll dwarf you. Don't let us get beside you. We'll suffocate you. But everything you do, wake up every morning, deal with every customer, and be proud that we're behind you. You have this great company behind you. We'll do anything for you. And we're counting on you to be the one to decide to take the touchdown and go for the seven points. And so I would say, I'm so proud to be here. <laughs> Thank you for visiting. Okay, so we're going to take a couple questions. Oh, good. Thank you for asking that one we'd set up earlier. My name is Rob Bramo. I'm with the Power Utility in Sacramento. Hey, Rob. In re reading your bio, I understand you're also on the board of directors for Excel Energy, Correct. the holding company. And right. I'd be interested in your comments on regional activities and innovations, whether it be energy or banking around um, public policy on climate change and sure. greenhouse gas regulations? Thank you, Rob. Um, I will say, first of all, the company I'm with is number one now in renewable energy, and we're very proud of that. And wind energy is a really neat thing coming forward. On an energy sidebar, I want you all to know that there's great strides being made in being able to transfer renewable energy into something, a price point now that we can all afford. Coal is coming back. Nuclear energy is not the bad word it used to be, but renewable energy, particularly wind and solar. Very, very powerful stuff, and I'm looking forward to that. In our company, Rob, we're adopting, in fact, we will announce at our shareholder meeting next month, we're adopting a green policy to follow suit with a number of other companies that are taking it upon themselves to do what's right to protect the future of this great country and this world. For us, it means things like using certain light bulbs in our companies. It means building new buildings with all renewable energy. It means supporting some ecological activities, lending to companies that support that, and frankly, not lending to those who don't. So it's a big, ca a big task because it's easy for us to lend to everybody. I would never lend to a person doing pornography. I shouldn't lend to somebody who's hurting the environment, not at this day and age. So I'm happy to report that you can look in April 16th, you'll see our new policy come out at the shareholder meeting. But we do support, I'll call it the green policy because it's good for business and I think it's the right thing for our country. The flag was supposed to come down to music at that point and I don't know <laughs> where it was. Yes, sir. Uh, Rick Fowler with USAA. Hi, Rick. And I, you spoke about diversifying income streams and the right. importance of that. I wonder what you think about the financial services supermarket, and especially in light of what Citibank and Travelers sure. did. Um, what he's asking about is banks that want to kind of do everything. And if you can't get out of banking, there's still a lot of banking to do, and so they're in everything, insurance and, and uh, investments, uh, uh, asset management, things like that. What's happened in the last, say, 10 years is a lot of the big banks started getting big by combining all kinds of capabilities and believing that they could cross-sell all these products to everybody else. And Rob, I don't believe in that, not just because we aren't there, but we actually had an investment bank called Piper Jaffrey, a great partnership. We dividended it back out. It's on its own now. It's worth billions of dollars. Here's what I learned. When I was at the bank that merged with U.S. Bank, we didn't have an investment bank. And I remember sitting around our management table thinking, wow, if only we had a merchant bank or an investment bank, our big corporate customers, like Patterson, for instance, would say, God, I need an investment bank. I'm going to work with you more than the other bank because you've got an investment bank. And we found out when we merged, we got one. And then we found out that each investment bank, not like any other company, has an expertise, like USA is expert in certain things. And our customers said, if I need a general investment bank, I'll be happy to use the one that you own, but promise me you won't shove it at me if it isn't the best in what I need. And when we let it go, we found out we lost nothing. They're better, we're better. It's like insurance. I don't distribute, I don't produce insurance. I shouldn't. I distribute some of your products, but I don't make it. And so I believe that we should stick to our, our, our knitting. We should do what we do really well and work with people who are better at what they do than I would be and bring that to our customers over time. So I think the supermarket is overrated. I think you're seeing the actions are more and more of the big banks are, are hiding off the pieces now and finding out that that probably was overrated. Okay, one more before Becky takes me with the king. Hi, my name is Andrea. I'm an MBA student here. Welcome. Um, with, just, with the growing competition that's going on out there and just also increased competition in trying to get your customer into the mail, into the envelope with direct mail and such like that, what are you doing to 
get new customers and get them to come to you? Thank you. Um, how are we growing our customer base? Number one, Sacramento is a great example. We are partnering with grocery partners to put our banks inside the grocery stores. And the reason I say that, think about this for a minute. If you were a branch manager at one of our brick and mortar branches, as we call it, the big standalone branches, you will probably see 200 customers on a busy day. You might see two of them that would come in from the street that don't already have business with you. If you are in Raley's or if you're in Albertsons, you're in somebody, a grocery store, and your market share is 11%, then 89% of the people walking in that building are opportunities to introduce yourself to them. And so one way is to put yourself in places people are. The next one is we're on corporate sites all over America. We're in airports. We're in hospitals. Anywhere there are 950 or more people on a campus of an employer campus, we will ask ourselves if we can put a branch on site because those same employers have child care and they have workout facilities and they have catering come by. And why not have a bank there to meet their needs? So the best answer is we're trying to find our way into the lives of our potential customers by making ourselves more convenient. And then we have to earn it by being better. But it's as simple as that. I wish it was more provocative, but it's pretty much that. And look, she's coming up. She's going to hurt me. So um, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure to be in your presence tonight. Thank you so much. Don't go away. All right. I was, I was right, wasn't he? He's a charismatic speaker. <laughs> um, for, first, I have a UC Davis Yay. pin for you. I need another lapel pin. <laughs> So go with your I will U.S. Do it. bank. I will wear it. We also have a UC Davis sweatshirt go for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we have some more UC Davis I love it. for you. <laughs> and, and I have the photographs to go with it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you, you once do. again. And congratulations Thank you to you. So I'm honored much. to thank be you here. So thank much you for coming. Thank you.